And then uh, the Cossack division is sent to Petersburg because there have been political uprisings in Petersburg, and they're supposed to defend this provisional government about which they have the slightest notion. And in Petersburg, we have a scene between Lisnitsky and one of the Bolshevik agitators, actually a fairly a rather attractive man named Dugin, who says to Lisnitsky, look, your family has 8,000 acres on its estate. My family can barely scratch a living out of a small land parcel. Shouldn't you give me some of your land? Well, uh, Lisnitsky says, look, uh, uh, that land is ours. That, that land is our property. Uh, if, if we give this to other people, what will, be, what will be left of our land? And Dugan says, look, if you were cold and I had, uh, ha I had only one coat, I'd give you the coat off my back. Of course, Lysinski has no answer to this. He begins to realize that the gulf between him and the soldiers is becoming deeper and deeper. And of course, the argument becomes a lot less abstract when suddenly uh, Lysinski orders the brutal beating of a revolutionary agitator and the Bolshevik soldier cries out desperately against the inhumane treatment. We see the chasms developing between officers and men, a chasm which is not going to let this army exist for a very long time. A little bit later, the Cossacks are on a train because they are being told by their officers they're going to join the right-wing forces under General Kornilov, which are attempting to overthrow the provisional government of Kerensky and go back to a more conservative, perhaps even a Tsarist government. And in this scene, suddenly, Bunchuk, that uh, soldier that we saw earlier giving Lysnitsky a hard time in World War I who had suddenly disappeared, suddenly reappears. And he speaks to the Cossacks in a language that they understand, telling them, look, don't go joining this man. Don't overthrow the provisional government. We have a program that's much better. If you, if you go with this man, Kornilov, you're going to be back in the same situation you were before. Come with us and, and carry out our program, and you'll be much better off. And his language manages to carry the day, uh, most especially because another officer who tries to speak against him is uh, cold-bloodedly executed by Dugin with a bullet in the face. And of course, the novel presents very vividly here the kind of terror and the kind of murder that's going to take place in revolutionary times. Well, Gregor finds himself surrounded by tremendously conflicting political opinions. Uh, on the one hand, there are those who want him to join the right-wing forces that will reestablish the old-fashioned kind of Tsarist government. On the other hand, there are the revolutionaries who want to come over to the revolutionary side and uh, establish an entirely new kind of government where even people like him would be a part of the government. And then, of course, there are people like a character named Izvarian who want him to fight for an independent Cossack regime. The Cossacks will secede from the Union and have their own independent state. Gregor's pushed and pulled in many, many different directions. He, he doesn't know where to go. And as a matter of fact, there are times when Gregor is brought by another character named Patyolkov, a Bolshevik commander, to come over to the side of the extreme revolutionaries. But it's interesting that as Gregor, who after all doesn't know much about politics, is trying to make his way in an argument with Patyolkov, Gregor asks Patyolkov, well look, you've solved all kinds of problems. You say people like myself could even become elected to the government. You say that we'll elect a government that will represent the people. What about the land? Are we going to have to give up our land to the peasants? And for the first time, Patyolkov, who's been a very, very fluent agitator, is uncharacteristically embarrassed because, of course, Patyolkov can't tell him the real program of the revolutionaries who want to collectivize the land and have it owned by the states and take it away from the Cossacks. He can't tell Gregor about this, so he, he takes refuge in some sort of vague words about, well, we'll settle that later. No, of course, we won't give up the land. You'll have a chance to work the land. And, of course, this very point is later going to become the Achilles heel of the Soviet regime. That is, the ownership of land was something that not only were they struggling with all the way through Soviet history, but uh, Russia is still struggling with today. Uh, it's remarkable how uh, these problems have remained in Russia over many, many different generations. And the novel, of course, puts its finger precisely on this kind of a problem. The form of land, the form of land ownership, all these things are sore points throughout the 20th century and can continue down to the present day. The question of political control, obviously, was settled by the Bolshevik seizure of power from the Duma and its democratic parties. Uh, that we already know. Lenin and his followers were determined to create what they called a dictatorship of the proletariat. Naturally, this left the vast non-proletarian majority of the Russian population in limbo, and this was most especially true of the Cossacks, who'd been the military mainstay of Tsarist power. The result of this division of the population was a hideously bloody and destructive civil war,
and the Cossacks, with their military traditions, were deeply and tragically immersed in the general butchery. In the beginning of the part of the novel devoted to the Civil War, the reader sees Bunchuk reporting to a Bolshevik commander named Abramson in Bolshevik military headquarters. Not only do we see a Jewish officer, previously unthinkable in the Russian context, but he virtually forces Bunchuk to admit a woman into his group taking instruction about the use of the machine gun. Bunchuk says, for goodness sake, a woman, what's a woman doing with a machine gun? But, uh, but he says, look, these are orders, you take her. Well, the young woman, Anna Pagutko, also turns out to be Jewish, and she, ex she exhibits unusual spirit and intelligence in the group. Uh, Bunchu can't resist her energy and spirit, and of course, as you might guess, very soon they become lovers. Of course, previously it would have been unthinkable that a man like Bunchuk would have had a love affair with a Jewish woman like Anna, but of course, dramatic social changes are taking place in Russia, and things are very different now. Their relationship is, is presented in a rather sensitive and touching way. Obviously, what Sholokhov's trying to do here is to give us some sympathy for uh, attractive characters among the, uh, bol among the Bolsheviks. Uh, he wants to get the novel published in Soviet times. But their conversation is entirely different from what we hear among the Cossacks. When they talk about their future married happiness in terms of a mighty, perfectly harmonized hymn to socialism, we understand that we're hearing empty rhetoric rather than the expression of human feeling. One gets the impression that Sholokhov is writing these lines to make sure the book can be published. The relationship between the two of them develops in a perfectly believable way. Uh, there are moments, of course, when she gets angry at him, especially when he finds himself impotent, uh, when she comes to him for the first time wanting to really have close physical relationships. Uh, he's, of course, tremendously eager for this, and he, he goes toward her only to find that he's totally impotent, that he's unable to carry through. Uh, the reason is that he's been supervising every night, he's been supervising the execution by firing squads of hundreds of arrested Cossacks, and this, of course, has drained him of the life force. Uh, happily for the both of them, late, a few weeks later, he gets his force back, and they do manage to have a genuine relationship, particularly after she nurses him back to health when he suffers from a bout of typhus. Uh, she's a real support for Bunchuk in times of battle. Anna, a woman, handles a machine gun in ways that are much more effective than any of the men around her. And of course, uh, for Bunchuk, she becomes something tremendously important, tremendously human, tremendously necessary. And of course, he's devastated and virtually dehumanized when she's killed by an enemy bullet. And all of a sudden, he's lost this tremendous support that he's found in Anna. Meanwhile, Gregor has been fighting with the Bolsheviks. The propaganda of Garanja that he had in the hospital has taken hold with him. He sees the kind of atrocities that are being carried out by the White Army, and he decides that he will fight with the Red Troops. He goes into Patyolkov's battalion, and uh, as a matter of fact, several times saves the day when otherwise the White officers would have, uh, would have, car would have carried the battle. And at one particular point, uh, he saves the day in such a way that they managed to capture, the Reds managed to capture all the white officers uh, who were in charge of that particular battle. And remember now that all the way through the book, Gregor has stood against the slaughter of unarmed prisoners. When he tries to argue this with Pachelkov, Pachelkov is ordered to send the prisoners back to headquarters so headquarters can get the necessary military information out of them. Pachelkov says, in a pig's eye, I'll do that. We'll slaughter them all right here. When Gregor realizes that Patyolkov and his men are about to slaughter these unarmed prisoners, he tries to stop it. But of course, he's unable to do it because he's been wounded in the leg, and as soon as he tries to walk on that leg, he totally collapses. But when he sees Patyolkov mercilessly murdering these prisoners, he says, I can't stay with this. This is something I can't put up with. And he goes back to his Cossack village where, once again, he rejoins the Cossack forces who are resisting the Red Army, who are resisting the Socialist uh, Authority. And then he hears the Red forces are invading the district, and of course they're also behaving badly. The Cossacks pull themselves together and once more make a formidable local fighting force. So here, Gregor has gone back and forth, having no idea quite what he was doing. Well, Patelka's forces come into the region, in order to try to take control for the Soviet power, but the further they get into the region, the more hostile they find the local population. They had come from a place where 
There had been at least some sympathy for the revolution, but now as they came further and further into the hinterland, they find people who have no understanding of what the revolution is all about. All they know is that these people are against religion, these people are against the traditions that they've known before. Patyolkov's forces realize they're coming into essentially enemy territory. And they don't quite know what to do, but Patyolkov insists that they go forward, and all of a sudden, they find themselves surrounded by Cossack troops, the Cossack troops who have mobilized, as I said before. They have no choice but to surrender. The Cossacks promise them that once they surrender, they'll be dealt with humanely, and there'll be no problem for them. They can go back home. It'll be all right. And so there's presumably, in a rather friendly way, they surrender. But no sooner have they surrendered than suddenly the Cossacks surround them and force them to go on a, they, they make them go on a forced march uh, to a local barn, which is located there. And it's clear that in the morning, they're all going to be executed. The same Gregor, who throughout the novel has been against the execution of uh, unarmed uh, prisoners, is now suddenly forced to watch the execution of almost the whole Red Force, people with whom uh, not very long before he'd been fighting. And this execution, as horrible as it is, uh, taking them out one by one and shooting them, is made even worse because they save the execution of Pacholkov, their leader, till the very end by hanging him. And in attempting to hang him, they hang him inefficiently so that he's, he's, he's left for agonizing minutes with his feet barely scraping the ground and he's choking to death and spittle going out of his mouth in all directions. It's a hideous end, showing the, the terrible amount of cruelty and suffering imposed by a time which pulls the society up by its roots. There's probably no better existing picture of a giant revolution in action than this novel. It really makes an enormous impression on the reader and really gives you a sense of what happens to people in the course of the revolution when these people are on the ground and victims and a part of it. In this place, as in many others, Sholokhov shows a considerable amount of insight and courage in writing the way he did. It's a sad thing to have to recount what happened to him later in the 1960s. You understand, of course, that's over a generation, it's almost a generation and a half from the time that he wrote the novel. By the 1960s, he'd become a kind of a classic in the history of Soviet literature. His novel had been awarded the Nobel Prize for political reasons that we'll go into a little bit later when we talk about Pasternak. At this time, in the middle of the 1960s, two Soviet writers, Daniel and Sinyavsky, were arrested for sending some of their dissenting works abroad. Now you understand, there was no law against, there was no Soviet law against sending your work abroad, but uh, the Soviet government was embarrassed by this, and so they arrested these writers and put them in a forced labor camp with a stern regime. When they did this, there was a tremendous protest throughout the world, even the Canadian Communist Party, a protest of the Soviet government's action. The Soviet government tried to mobilize writers to defend itself, and there was no one who would sign their statement with one exception. And that exception was Sholokhov, who not only came out in support of the government's action, but said, ah, these green guys wet behind the ears, uh, they don't know what real revolution is. In revolutionary days, they would have been sh stood up against a wall and shot, and that's what we should have done to him here. When he said that, he got back through the mail over 10,000 copies of Quiet Flows of the Dawn. That's what his readers thought of him. And there was an open letter by a very courageous Soviet woman, Lydia Chukovskaya, which eloquently replied to Sholokhov's action. She sent this open letter to the New York Times and to Pravda. I'll give you one guess as to which paper printed it. And in this letter she said, Sholokhov, you don't seem to understand that one of the greatest qualities of Russian literature is this deep compassion for those who suffer. It's always on the side of the victim. And you, who showed such sympathy for the Cossacks at one time, now side with the government and not only say that they should have been arrested, you not only support their arrest, but you say they should have been stood up against a wall and shot. And for that, she said, Russian literature will never forgive you. For that, Russian literature can wish you only one thing, and that is utter sterility. These words hit Sholokhov like a bullet between the eyes. He simply collapsed as a writer. And of course, later, some years later, he died not in very good odor in the opinion of those who love literature. And yet, in spite of all this, and this is really very sad for Sholokhov, it still remains to be said that this novel is a very powerful novel, a very powerful novel that shows us things that happened at a very, very important time in history, and we can be very, very glad that we have the novel and the effect that it produces.